How's it going lads and ladies? It is Petrifying Pumpkins here and I want to talk about this article over here that you've probably seen by now or at least heard talked about by now. This article is from IGN by the author Taylor Lyles and it goes into detail on like a review of the PSVR 2 after its first year anniversary like a lot of us have kind of been doing lately in the PSVR 2 space. This one is certainly negative. You can tell just by reading the title and there's been a lot of backlash from PSVR2 YouTubers and, you know, social media account users or whatever you want to call uh, the people you follow who do PSVR2 content. Basically, a lot of them disagreeing with this, dismissing this as unfair criticism from IGN and, you know, mainstream media in general, as we've kind of been seeing for a long time when it comes to virtual reality headsets. And what I wanted to do was go over it. As you can see, with certain highlighted colors here. I want to see what they got wrong, what they got right, try and be more even-handed about it because I don't think it's something that should be dismissed entirely like some people seem to think. While I do think there is blatant misinformation or just like, you know, uneducated facts thrown out here or opinions, uh, they definitely do have some things right. So the stuff that I think is wrong, I've highlighted in red. The stuff that I think they got right, I highlighted is in green. And as you'll see, if we scroll down the whole thing, you get a gist of this, I think. The green outweighs the red you know there's certainly more green as we scroll down further and further now i'm not going to read the whole thing but i will go over the parts i've highlighted and explain why i think it's right but i will ignore the first one here uh, because i'll get back to that laser if i can remember which i probably won't fast forward to just over a year after its release and the psvr2 has not achieved its full potential between its lack of first party exclusives now i've highlighted that red because that's simply not true day one was three first party exclusives and then firewall ultra came out just a few months later so that's four first party exclusives in just the first year consoles don't do that good playstation 4 did not launch with four first party title well maybe in the entire year it did but you know it was considered this is considered kind of standard Maybe it's not amazing, but for us who have been on PSVR 1 and we went to this, you know, to have Gran Turismo 7 Day 1, to have Resident Evil, well, I'm sorry, that's third party, to have, you know, Horizon Call of the Mountain was uh, really, really impressive. And, you know, it was very promising as well. But she doesn't stop there. Steep price, that's true. 600 euro is steep. In a world where people are looking at Quest, which is the dominant headset, and they see the price that that's at, and it's a standalone, it doesn't need a PS5, you know, obviously you, can, you can't argue that the price is steep. Lack of backward compatibility, that's true. I mean, it's not a positive. And retail delays, that's another truth. You know, this thing wasn't even available to buy in a, any retailer. You couldn't just walk in. You had to order directly from Sony themselves, at least in the major markets. Uh, that wasn't the case for me here in Ireland. But in America, that's what you had to do. Canada, etc. So let me scroll down a bit more. And I think they get a lot wrong here. So... Yet, as I pointed out before its release last year, one of the major measures of success for the PSVR 2 is a strong showing of exclusive content, and that part has generally failed to materialize in the year since release. Absolutely false. Absolutely false. I basically covered it already in the um, this part up here, but yeah, the first year for PSVR 2 has been amazing. Uh, maybe it's exceeded my wildest dreams to a degree for year one for year one then we'll go down a little bit further so take the psvr 2's launch lineup which featured over 40 games it's an impressive number but upon closer inspection only three of those games were true psvr 2 exclusives and only one of those games horizon call of the mountain went beyond an optional vr mode this is where i take issue uh, that only three of these games were true psvr 2 exclusives why does that why is that a bad thing why is it a bad thing to only have three PSVR 2 exclusives among 40 games? Shouldn't the main selling point be that there is 40 games? You know, you're acting as if everybody else has already bought all those games. I mean, you don't do this for console. You don't be like, oh, Call of Duty is on PS5, but it's also on Xbox. So that's a bad thing. And then this other part down here at the very end, which is, a, this is something I find it hard to get my head around as well. Basically diminishing hybrid games like Resident Evil's by saying they're only optional VR modes. When many of us know that these hybrid games are far superior, like for example, Resident Evil Ace is just way better than Horizon Call of the Mountain. And Horizon Call of the Mountain is good. Uh, really good, maybe. But Resident Evil Ace, an optional VR mode, and Gran Turismo 7, an optional VR mode, are fucking phenomenal. Best in class. So this is not a valid criticism. And it's not even subjective it's ob no sorry yes it's not even subjective it's objective 
That's not a bad thing. That is optional. Shouldn't be highlighted like that, like a little dig. By comparison, Meta has dominated. Yes, it has. That's just the facts. Because it has desirable exclusives like Resident Evil 4 VR. Now, that's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. You're telling me this is bad. Having Resident Evil 8 and Resident Evil 4 remake as optional VR modes, no good. That's a bad thing. But over here, having the, the original version of Resident Evil 4, the 2005, and the graphics look like they're from 2005, having that version <laughs> on Quest is why it's dominating. Uh, they don't add up to me. You kind of try to justify this by saying that it was built ground up. But, I mean, what's the difference, really, if you look at the two games side by side? Both of them have the 2D cutscenes. Uh, both of them have motion controls added in. Like, you're acting as if nothing was, no work was done when it comes to optional VR modes. But there is considerable work done that Sony themselves funded, which should be taken into account. And uh, listen, I don't, it's one thing to have this opinion up here. If that's what you believe, that fine, that's what you believe. But then to do this down here, then it feels like there's a, an agenda, you know, because this is a complete contradiction. Uh, this is a game, by the way, up here, Resident Evil 4, let's pretend this is talking about Resident Evil 4 Remake for PS4 2. That's a free update. Anyone who owned Resident Evil 4 Remake got that for free. Down here, you have a game from 2005 where they charged you again to buy it. Anyway, elsewhere, third-party support for PS4 2 has mostly been okay. Games like Supermassive's The Dark Picture, Switchback, and the now-defunct First Contact's Firewall Ultra were met with lukewarm receptions. That's true. They were. Particularly, Firewall Ultra has been completely, like, really divisive with people. And Switchback, while it's in a much better state right now, it did launch in a state that some people would say is, you know, not acceptable. She then mentions, you know, that C-Smash was one of the best exclusives Though the latter will become a multi-platform release this April, the reason I got that highlighted in red, not because it's wrong, that it is going to become a multi-platform, but because it's not a bad thing. You know, Baldur's Gate launched on PS5 and then it came out to Xbox a couple of months later. Stalker is going to come on Xbox, but then it's going to come on PS5 at a, a certain time after that. But you're not going to put that against Xbox. You're going to have that as a positive. That's a pro for Xbox that they have a timed exclusive. But here it's a negative for the PSVR 2 to have timed exclusives. Despite touting the PSVR 2 as AAA VR platform, Sony doesn't seem interested in having its first party studios work on VR games. So Yellow, you're wondering why is this in Yellow? It's because it's partly true. Uh, so obviously she's ignoring the year one first party titles, which is why that part is wrong. However, if you're looking at it from a today perspective and looking toward tomorrow, then this is right because we don't see Sony with any kind of indication that they're working on a like first party PSVR 2 stuff. Uh, we had the Insomniac leak where we, you know, first party studio with a VR pedigree and we know their roadmap for the next 10 years is just a bunch of Marvel games with no VR support for any of them. Obviously that could change, but as it is now, you know, bleak uh, when it comes to PS4 2. That doesn't mean that a team of Sobe are not working on a PS4 2 game. We just don't know about it. It doesn't mean that maybe, you know, Sony Santa Monica don't have something in the works for PS4 2. We don't know, but just the fact that Sony isn't communicating with this. Uh, with us that they are so it's understandable why you would think there's no PSVR or sorry there's no first party support for PSVR 2 so I can't criticize that too much however you just know that they're ignoring the games that released year one which is not cool gonna scroll down again abandoned by its creator one year later PSVR 2's first party support leaves a lot to be desired no it doesn't I'm not going to go over this again because that was the whole first part of this video but yeah one year later is actually first party support's really fucking good Year two is another question. And then we get the tweets of people complaining, including colleague, IGN colleague, echoing some of this stuff, but we've talked about this tweet in the podcast before, so I'm not going to go over why what's wrong about that. Uh, we'll scroll down again. The lack of AAA support in VR is a recurring issue in the market. Yes, it is. So you might not think it is for PSVR 2 because we've got like a, quite a few AAA games on PSVR 2, but in general, overall, in the market, that is true. After all the enthusiasm for Half-Life Alex, the anticipated wave of big-budget VR releases has failed to materialize. Again, not specific to PSVR 2 because we did have a little bit of a wave of AAA titles at launch on PSVR 2. But yes, the big, you know, Half-Life Alex was kind of supposed to be this big turning point where, you know, PC VR was really going to take off and a lot more of these games were going to happen, but they didn't. Uh, so that's another kind of understandable out point or outlook to have or view point to have. That's why I said out point because I was trying to mix those two words together. 
scrolling down to this part here. So analyst Piers Hardine says that because Sony has positioned its VR headset as a support product for the PS5, combined with slow sales means that third-party VR game devs will be looking at the Quest ecosystem as a less risky proposition. That's just how it is. That's just the facts. Look at Rec Room. They don't want to develop on PSVR 2 because it's not financially viable. You look at the contractors, developers. They're telling us that uh, they're thinking about the PSVR 2, but they're not going to commit to us. Look at the Ghost of Tabor developers uh, who are saying on their Discord that Ghost of Tabor's PSVR 2 version is probably just going to cost them money. They're not, not going. They're not expecting to make money on that. So that's why all these games are and all these developers are prioritizing more successful platforms like the quest and then of course this highlights the rec room thing which we just touched on so i'm not going to go over that uh, even for the games that it does put out though sony's marketing for psvr 2 has a history of being underwhelming i think we can all agree on that according to a source sony would only market their games exclusively with playstation blog posts and this is something we've been complaining about for what feels like forever now and there's also the you know the sizzle reels they do with the trailers but they're like you know not really promoted they're not tv spots or anything they're just kind of trailers they put on their channel well maybe some of them have been on tv i just haven't seen them uh but they're mostly just things they put out in their channel every once in a while where they highlight the same few games over and over again like ghostbusters keeps getting in these things and uh, where she's talking about these kind of highlights as a real things where she says you know she talks about the games that were included with the exception of resident Evil 4 remake viewer a majority of these games are not exclusive to ps4 2 and the well that's true i've highlighted that in red because that's not a bad thing it is not a bad thing that your headset can play good third-party games. That is a good thing. It makes sense to highlight these things. Sony have had PS4 trailers where they highlight Destiny. You know, Destiny was on Xbox. Destiny was on, or later came to PC. Uh, Destiny is a multi-platform game, but they were highlighting us in their own adverts. And there was no criticism of that. It made sense. You know, you want to show off, yes, we've got the big Ghostbusters IP or whatever else they have among us you know what while sony took a similar approach with the original ps viewer that headset had less competition and was pitched as being a more affordable alternative i highlighted this one green because i think this is a really good point it's something i haven't really thought about uh, because i'm so used to the quest being the affordable alternative but actually yeah the ps viewer one did come out in a time where there was no quest and everyone was talking about the ps viewer one and said hey this is the cheapest way to get into vr so that's a really good point that's how the market has shifted now that's not that's not how it is for ps viewer 2 Marketing and price point aside, the PSVR 2 was sold exclusively on PlayStation Direct for the first few months. Again, that can't be beneficial. You know, you want us in as many places as possible. You want to be able to walk into a Best Buy over in America, Walmart, whatever you have over there, and just pick up your PSVR headsets without having to go through a website where, you know, it may or may not be well advertised that that's the only place to get them. So the common man doesn't just walk through the streets and see a sign up in the shop saying, oh, PSVR 2 headset for sale. Not a good thing. We'll skip down here. We got some kind of analyst from Omdia, uh, Gigi Ashvili. He believes that just over 1 million PSVR 2s were sold in his first year. On paper, that does not sound bad, but Sony's reportedly made 2 million PSVR 2s before release and reduced shipments a month before release. Then the reason I have that highlighted in red, even though it's backed up with sources, is because after these articles came out, I believe these are the Bloomberg, the Bloomberg ones by the uh, Tamaguchi. I can't remember his surname. Japanese sounding name, which uh, I can't remember, but this guy was kind of called out by Sony saying, no, that's not true. We never reduce shipments. So that's why I've got that in red because Sony have come out and dismissed this. The next part here, it also lagged behind the original PS Viewer, which was able to surpass 1 million less than a year after launch and 2 million units by the end of 2017. Now, the only reason I'm saying that this might not be rice with whites and yellow is because we're going by what George G.G. Ashvili believes, not any hard numbers. So we don't actually know how many PS Viewer 2s uh, have been sold he suspects it's around a million i suspect based on what developers have said that he's probably right but he might not be so that's why that's yellow what's more it appears that the psvr 2 sold poorly during the 2003 uh sorry 2023 holiday season and this is based on what we saw with the road to viewer tracked amazon sales of the Mesa Quest 2 and 3 compared to psvr 2 which found that Mesa headsets significantly outsold psvr 2 it was like a race of 30 to 1 which was absolutely ridiculous. That's true. PSVR 2 looks like the evidence is there that it's sold poorly, you know, and I don't think the quests are, you know, doing amazingly well. They're doing decent probably, but not setting the world on fire, which kind of makes this look even worse for PSVR 2. So he's saying based on these numbers, the PSVR 2 accounted for 5% while all Master Quest's Quest headsets combined accounted for 75%. Uh, maybe that should be yellow because, you know, we don't definitely know. 
uh, but it seems like it's probably right. So what happens next? Last December, SIE's head of global business said in an interview with Financial Times that the PSVR 2 was a bit of a challenging category right now, adding that he thought there was a higher expectation generally for what VR would do to gaming. So that's kind of a little bit of a, a red flag that he's talking like this, and that's what he said, so that's green. But a year after release, it's clear the PSVR 2's biggest problem is that it just doesn't have the games it needs to make it worth the price. I disagree. Um... Again, this is just dismissing what we have on year one, which is seems unfair and unreasonable. And it doesn't look like the matters will be improving anytime soon. The reason I have that in green is because we don't look like we have a year two that's going to be better than year one. Right now, as it stands, and that could all change tomorrow with the blog post or stays of play or whatever, but as it stands right now, that's true. So Gigi Ashvili reiterates his predictions that Sony's headset is kind of screwed in the coming years, citing the fact that the lack of first-party games, that is in yellow because we do have first-party games, it's just that going forward, we don't know if we will have first-party games, and, you know, half right, you know, uh, until Sony prove otherwise, the onus is on them to do that. And then the rest of it is true, though. You know, the layoffs, the studio closures affecting PSVR 2 developers um, make PSVR 2's future look fairly bleak. I think that's true. These things certainly don't help PSVR 2's future, do they? Therefore, they, they lessen the outlook of PSVR 2. We'll skip on down here where they're talking about the PC compatibility with PC, or sorry, PSVR 2. So they said, yet, whilst they kind of put this as a positive, even though I won't say that's yes or no yet because... I'm not really sure what the extent is. What exactly does it mean? Uh, Sony haven't clarified what exactly they mean with the PC stuff. Is it just going to be plugged into the PC? Are we going to be using a PS5 to do this as well? Too many questions remain. Anyway, yet PSVR 2 is entering the PC VR market at an awkward time. Gigi Ashvili told IGN that recent Steam hardware service data suggests that there is no significant growth in that space. That's just true. The number of VR headsets owners with gaming PCs using Steam is not keeping up with the rapid growth of new Steam users. So it's like stagnating over there on PC. So really, how beneficial is it going to be for PS4 2 to go on PC when PC is not in the best position right now? Future support for PC viewer games makes it more comparable to other headsets on the market and will likely broaden its appeal to an extent, which I agree with, but I would put the emphasis on to an extent you know I, I again i don't see any reason why this is going to light the world on fire on pc and you know all of a sudden start selling millions and millions i think it'll be a limited benefit currently the psvr2 is declining a year later and is at risk of suffering the same fate as the vita and the reason i have that yellow is because kind of even though it kind of seems that way we still don't have any hard data to back that up so it's not something i can confirm even though it kind of feels that way and that's the end of the article so when you go over all of us, even though when they come to, I think the main sticking point for people disagreeing with this has to be, you know, all the stuff they talk about with exclusives in the year one and how year one was bad, even though it really wasn't. But I think it would be a mistake to dismiss the entire article because of those mistakes. You know, I think most of this is green. Most of the stuff I've highlighted is green. These points are green. Um, so that's why I'm going back to the title. Why do I have this in red? is because I think it could be changed to a year since its release, Sony seems to be abandoning PlayStation VR 2. Not to have abandoned. As it stands right now, they haven't abandoned it. But it does the outlook right now. If, the, if this title was to be abandoning, I would agree with it. And it would be forcing Sony to prove me wrong and to prove them wrong. Uh, which is why I kind of, I'm happy enough, like a lot of people think this is a terrible, like, you know, this is article 50-50, has its positives, has its pros. The positive is maybe Sony see this and is like, okay, we need to show people a roadmap for PS4 2. That's a potential positive. The negative is that consumers read this and they don't buy a PS4 2. So it's up to us to figure out which is, <laughs> which is, if it's a more positive or more negative, I don't know. Anyway, I've talked enough about this. I want to hear your thoughts on this in the comments below, if you have any. And before I end the video, though, I would like to thank my channel members whose names are on the screen as I speak. And they are the following. Muzz, Dead Eye Dan, Chopped, PPE, No One Knows, Movemaster, Make Esports, Commentator for Hire, DJ the Pumpkin Patch Kid, Pete Hawkins, Gaming Reptiles and Nonsense, Crumb, Superfly AF, Edify Till I Die, Lone Wolf Vior, Aced, Mr. 777, Dante, Bruce, Geza, 
at Puck DC, FC, JL, Germ Warfare, Brian Tam, 86 The Mad Hazard, Horatio Ward, Piotrick F, Durbin Brown, Funky Sloth, Higher Primate 30, Prophecy 777, Amanda Clark, Shapeshifter, The Amorphous Gamecast, Nert Boglin, Freps Nominal, Roy Schwartz, Cheeb Eam, Jeremiah, Love Machine 83, Scoby Man, The Gamecast, Infinity Lefty, Maiki Moy, Vincent McLoin, DJ Sun 57, Unstable Fox, Owen Evans, TB, Jason Ewan, Roy Martini, Mr. Tortoise, Ezekiel, Solid Justice, Merck Smith, not reading that, Bosk, Shadow XJ, it's free real estate, Turbro Turner, Chairface, and Jimmy Nuisance. If you want to join the membership, you can by hitting the join button below. You get ex access to exclusive channel perks and whatnot. That is it for this video. However, thank you very much for watching. I'll see you in the next one. Please stay nice and moist.